Dr. Campbell, now if you would bring us to this macro picture, the, the peak oil. Uh, first of all, what is peak oil? And, and I think you have a very a famous example of your illustration of, of showing it uh, with a glass of uh, beer. Would you take us to that example for an average audience that trying to uh, comprehend this? At, if you would, put it in a, in a layman's term. Yes, well, I mean, I think every beer drinker understands that the glass starts full, and it ends empty. I mean, nobody would dispute that. And the second point that every beer drinker understands is that the quicker you drink it, the sooner it's gone. Well, if, if we could uh, sit, as this picture shows, uh, uh, for 200 years in an Irish pub drinking some Irish uh, Murphy stuff here, the picture would look something like this. The glass is full around 1900, or almost full around 1900. It's about half empty at the end of the last century, and there are only a few dregs left at the end of this century. So that sort of tells the picture of oil. I, I should stress that peak oil does not mean running out. It means the, the, the date and the concept that there is a maximum production the production rises to a peak and then it declines. That's the concept of peak oil. We can argue forever about the date. As I say, it's not an exact thing, but it's more or less as we speak. Uh, but eventually, what is more important than the actual date is the vision of the long decline on the other side of it, which leads to near exhaustion by the end of this century. And that's a very critical issue given the, the really heavy dependence of the modern world on cheap oil-based energy. When we discuss the finite resources of the earth, uh, it has been said that actually your article, The End of Cheap Oil, that was in 1998, probably was the beginning of the new dialogue on peak oil. Now, for our audience to bear in mind, at the time your article came out, the price of oil was somewhere in the 11 to 12 dollar barrel, nothing alarming that would get anybody's attention. The fair question for you, sir, is that when you wrote that article, what kind of reaction did you get from your peers, from uh, the environment that you were in? Well, uh, you know, I spent my life in the oil business, and, and it was no big surprise. I mean, I learned very on, early on that Every region I worked in had its limits. We were finding less and less. The difficulties of finding more were, were increasing. So just simply from my own professional experience, I, 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 I realized the sort of fundamental underlying nature of the depletion. But I, I, a lot of problems, and so I, speaking as a geologist, and I should stress that the training of a geologist is simply to describe things. We're not, we're not like... Engineers say, give me a screwdriver, I take you to the moon. But we are simply people who describe things. That is our background and, and, and the nature of our, our, our work. So I was simply interested in describing something. I didn't have any great motivation to do this other than describe it. Um, but uh, when that article came out, and there were other articles and so on, it uh, began to see the political comfortable uh, the, the different points of view of different elements. The economists, for example, they have a fundamental, deep-seated faith in the market to deliver. They say, well, if you want more oil, raise the price and drill more wells. It's as simple as that for them. And, and they have great difficulty in accepting the finite limits of the planet. Move to the politicians. They, it's very difficult for a politician to come forward with a uh, presenting a problem unless he has a solution to that problem. So, in general, the politicians have tried to sidestep this issue, although I must say they're becoming more and more sort of aware of it and ready to discuss it. Engineers, they have another mindset altogether. They say, well, okay, well, you know, we can find technological solutions, and to some degree they will, of course. But I think that the, 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 the enormous role of oil in the modern world which is now subject to natural depletion, will have a huge impact that will minimize the impacts of these different viewpoints. Uh, Dr. Campbell, when, when we're talking about the um, peak oil, 
as, as you have written over and over, the blood of our economy, I mean, we have a $56 trillion economy in the world that is really based on cheap and accessible oil. Obviously, in this structure of world economy, we have watchdogs. International um, Energy Agency, IEA, is one of those. Please tell us what, what's the mandate of IEA and why isn't IEA as explicitly describing this dire situation as you are? Well, the, it's an interesting thing. The IEA, I, I can't remember now exactly, but I think it was set up by Kissinger some um, 20, 30 years ago, and its main function was to look after the interests of the consumers, to organize and, and manage the building up of strategic stocks in case there would be another oil shock, as there was. So it saw itself really as an organization to counter the influence of OPEC. So you had this two sides uh, sort of situation. And back in about 1995, uh, a group within the IA came to understand peak oil, just as I've been describing it, and they started putting out some sort of coded hidden messages in their reports. But this was politically unacceptable at that time, and it was all suppressed. So the IEA has, has uh, and, and uh, I don't exactly criticize them, their function is to try to look after the consumers in, in relation to OPEC, and so any admission of finite limits and the, the rules of nature really didn't fit their strategy, and so they've tried to evade it and, and sidestepped and double talk and everything else. But I must say, within the last year or so, they begin to come clean with the reality of the situation, and they, they issued a famous slogan not so long ago saying, Let, let's leave oil before it leaves us. Mm. And they are beginning to address this situation, and, and I think as the political situation evolves, governments around the world will welcome the new position of the IEA that makes it easier for individual countries to adopt appropriate policies. Now, would it be fair to say that really it is the mandate and the duty of IEA to potentially not want the OPEC to benefit because IEA is protecting the consumer in, of oil, particularly the Western uh, advanced countries. Now, would it be fair to say the reason IEA did not continue on the pa path of, of 15 years ago of wanting to discuss this in open, they didn't want OPEC to benefit from higher prices? Would it be fair to say that? Yes, I, I think that uh, they were com sort of, so to speak, competing with OPEC, and if, if they came to admit to the finite limits of the planet, which were then obvious, well, it could strengthen the hand of OPEC, and OPEC could say, well, look, you agree with us, basically, and we're in control. So to counter the, the strength of OPEC, they, they sidestepped and had exaggerated uh, uh, images of how much the rest of the world could produce and so on. So they tried to evade the issue of peak oil for very good political reasons. I'm not, I'm not critical of them. They were a political organization doing a political function. Yes. So essentially, I mean, if you, sir, or I, for that matter, if we were working for um, IEA, we would be doing our job. Now, the other organization, the watchdog in the United States, the U.S., um, EIA, um, Energy Information Administration, they seem to be even lagging behind IEA International. I mean, do you see a reason why they're even more cautious? Given as an example, uh, Dr. Hirsch, who has been on our show before, he uh, said it clearly back in 2005 when he was commissioned to do a job for our, our Department of Energy he was really pressed not to release the data, release the, the results. And, and do you see a difference uh, uh, between the United States dog watch, particularly, and the international dog watch? Well, I, I don't know, really. I mean, the United States, of course, is heavily dependent upon oil imports. I mean, the peak of production in the United States was in 1970. So. The United States' own production is falling steeply. That means it's ever more dependent on, on imports and this whole pressure to, to try to get as much as possible for as long as possible influences the political 
policy of the country and to admit to the peak oil issue is really not uh, not positive to those those policies but i think things are changing too and gradually the united states will have to face up to the reality of the position and find ways to use less and turn to renewables and all those things because the flat just isn't enough around to to meet everybody's needs and you have a whole military dimension to this, which is a bit sensitive, and I don't know, I probably shouldn't talk about. But I mean, uh, the United States has has military uh, bases scattered around the world on most of the important and vulnerable oil-producing areas. They're very concerned about supply, and and well, one can go down that path as far as one wants. But I can understand the position of the United States. It's it's desperately keen to maintain its imports. And this whole issue of peak oil is not welcome news by any means, but it is a reality. It is a reality, and as, as you pointed out, it appears at the, from the EIA's perspective that if the data and the information on the peak oil would be released, potentially OPEC would stand to benefit. Now, why isn't OPEC coming out and talking about it? OPEC appears to be really on the other side of the equation, stressing over and over as we see the Saudis and others to say that, we, that there is plenty of oil, don't worry about it. And as, as you pointed out through, uh, at the beginning of the show, uh, basically their reserves are very, very much questionable. But why wouldn't OPEC come out and say, hey, there is a peak oil? Well, I think we face the other side of the coin in relation to OPEC. Uh, these countries live on oil wealth. I mean, uh, it still costs, let's say, $20 a barrel to produce most of the oil in the Middle East. And when they sell it for 100 or more, they're making just a bundle of money. And so they're living in an extremely artificial world built on this oil wealth. And if you took the oil income away from the Middle East, they'd be back to living in deserts and difficult circumstances. So they, too, have an enormous vested interest in, in denying that this fundamental resource is depleting, they, they want to think they can go on forever living in the way they are, which is just as unre un unrealistic as it is for the Western countries. So there's a lot of political and, and, and let's say, social and whatever you like to call it, influences behind the different positions that different countries take. But the nature, she doesn't lie. She's 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 delivering her message pretty clearly these days. Okay, so OPEC, for the way you describe it, it does make sense. They want to be seen as a reliable supplier of fossil fuel. They have been for the past 100 years or so. They want to continue to be that. Now, there is another perspective, perspective of big oil. Large oil companies, with the exception of few, maybe Total and a few others that have come out in some shapes or form to express their concern but, for example, Exxon seems to be totally denying peak oil. Now, why wouldn't big oil, large oil companies, c talk about it? Wouldn't they stand to benefit at this short term? Well, the position of the international oil companies is an interesting one. I mean, uh, the stock exchange, you know, in the early days of the United States, the uh, United States is one of the few places where the mineral rights belong to the landowner. That meant that the mineral rights and the ownership of the oil, early oil fields in Texas long ago was highly fragmented. And it made enormous good sense for the stock exchange to impose very strict rules on what you could report as reserves to avoid any uh, fraudulent exaggeration. It made eminent good sense. And of course, the international companies were subject to the same general rules and so they reported conservatively. They were very cautious about they reported. They underreported in reality. And they found, of course, as they did so, that it made good sense and it was uh, attractive uh, for their position and image on the stock market to announce progressive upward revision as they revised their reserves upwards. So that's sort of the long history of the international companies. But I must say, in the last 10 years or so, uh, that was... Uh, Underreporting ceased to be possible because the major, the giant fields that gave greatest scope for over underreporting were maturing, 
and they found it easier to acquire reserves by acquisition rather than exploration, and so they, they merged, and so the seven major international oil companies are reduced to four now. And so it, they, they have to present a favorable image to the stock market, that's what their job is, and to speak of peak oil and to say we are a sunset industry declining just doesn't fit their image. So they try to evade the issue as much as they can, and reasonably so, uh, given uh, the sort of stock market and commercial pressures under which they work. So that's the position of the international companies. I think internally they understand this situation as clearly as I've described it. 